to see everyone here tonight. Good evening. There we go. Let's all stand. We're going to sing uh, the first song we're going to sing. Arise, King of Kings. We call upon your name, O oh Lord, name that is holy. We call upon your name, O oh Lord, name that is holy. We call upon your name, O oh Lord. We come to bring our praise to the one who was. Who is and is to come? Arise, King of Kings, God of all creation. O Lord, we cry. Arise. to the one who was of our Amen. Well, good evening. How's everybody doing tonight? I tell you what, it's a good-looking Wednesday night crowd. You know that? It's, it's definitely great to see you here tonight. And this is probably a dumb question, but I'm going to ask it anyways. Uh, how many of you still love Wednesday night service? Can I get a witness? And you're probably thinking, well, duh, we wouldn't be here if we didn't, right? 
But thank God for this, uh, this service we have here tonight. Listen, this is not just a, uh, just a fill an hour on our to-do list because there's nothing else to do in our lives, right? There's, because there's nothing on TV, certainly out of, you know, growing up, we had about 10 channels in my house and that was about 10,000. So certainly we could find something to do, but I thank God you chose to come to church tonight. And it's my prayer that you'll not regret it when you leave here. I can't make that happen, but God can. So let's pray and ask God to do that, would you? Father God, thank you so very much, Lord God, uh, for being here tonight. Dear God, I thank you for walking. Dear Father God, up and down the aisles and the pews. Dear God, in the, certainly the pulpit, dear Father God. And God, I just thank you so very much for the work you'll do here. Back in our mission kids, dear Father God, where uh, they're teaching them about uh, being on mission for you, dear God. And God, I pray to God, you bless the teen service now, Lord God. You just bless that as well. And God, may everything that we say and do lift up Jesus and God, I thank you because of the built-in promise in your Lord that when we do that, when we lift you up, we will be drawn closer to you. And that is exactly our heart's desire is to be closer to you, Father God. And I thank you for how you answer this prayer. I know you can. I know you want to. And I pray believing you will because I ask it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. I would tell you to be seated, but just keep on standing because we're asking you just to have a moment of fellowship. And I don't want to ask you to sit down and stand back up again. Uh, thank you. Uh, you're welcome. Okay. I'm looking out for y'all. Just a, just a few things. Uh, first of all, do we have any first-time guests here tonight? We got, we got some, if you got one down front here. If you're a first-time guest to Black Rock, thank you so very much for being here. Just raise your hand and just wave at me. Anybody wave at me tonight? Any, any other first-time guests we have here? Please uh, um, take that Connect card and, and fill it out both sides. Just drop it in our offering bag. We'd appreciate that. And um, just two things uh, uh, to make you aware of. You know, we've been putting them on the screen. But just to remind you, this Sunday we have a special uh, musical guest, Keith Plott. Uh, you probably never have heard him. I don't think he's ever been here before. But, you know, I had him, you know, at Pecan Park. Great, great, uh, talented man. He loved Jesus. And he's never been in, and uh, I've never been in a service with him where he never really ministered to me. So you're in for a blessing. Uh, we're going to have a Baptisms, you know, Sunday. Um, also, Sunday evening, have a special guest that's speaking. He, he's, a, he's an American guy, but he's a missionary to Vietnam. So make plans to be back here Sunday night as well. Go ahead and put it in your calendar, okay? All right, at this time, would you please uh, uh, just greet your neighbor. Let's have a moment of fellowship tonight. <laughs> return to our seats let's sing majesty majesty worship his majesty unto Jesus be all glory honor and praise majesty kingdom of His anthem raise. So exalt, lift up on high the name of Jesus. Magnify, come glorify Christ Jesus the King. Majesty, worship His majesty. Jesus who died, now glorified, King of all kings. 
let's sing it again and everyone sing. Majesty, worship His majesty. Unto Jesus be all glory, honor, and praise. Majesty, kingdom authority. anthem raise to exalt lift up on high the name of Jesus magnify come glorify Christ Jesus the King majesty worship his majesty Jesus who died now glorified King of all kings Amen Amen. Y'all may be seated I'm going to sing There's something about that name Jesus Jesus, Jesus There's just something about that name Jesus, 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 there's just something about that name, Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. Let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away, but there's something about that name. Let's sing it again. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's just something about that name. Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for the midweek service, Lord. We just come to get our tanks full again. Father, we pray now that, Lord, that you just bless this service, be with Brother John, Lord, as he brings the message, just hide him behind the cross. Father, we just pray that if there's anyone in this service tonight that doesn't know you as their personal Savior, they'll make the greatest decision in their life before they leave this place. Father, we ask now, Lord, that you just bless this offering as we take it, Lord, and we just spread your word throughout the kingdom of this world. For all these things, we ask your heavenly name. Amen. Amen.
You know, I don't know about you, but I can testify to the accuracy of that song. Is that right? Yeah. There is not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. Aren't you glad he's your friend? Do you please take a copy of God's Word and find me tonight in the first chapter of the Gospel of John? The Gospel according to John, chapter number 1. And when you find your place, if you can physically stand, please stand with me, with me tonight in honor and reverence to the reading of the Word of God tonight. I'll speak to you on this subject, the guiding light. The guiding light. And it's not the soap opera you used to watch or still watch or whatever you want to call it, but we're going to look at God's guiding light. The guiding light. You know, back in December, I preached the first five verses out of chapter 1. It was a Christmas message. We called it, you know, I'm dreaming of a light Christmas on how uh, John the Apostle spoke about Jesus being the light of the world. And so I was waiting for an opportune time just like now so we can have a consistency going forward to start this study. And so we're just going to pick up where we left off in verse 6 and just do a, a, a study to the whole Gospel of John. You okay with that? Amen. I hope so. We're going to do it anyways. I appreciate your, your participation. All right, verse 6. The Bible says that there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Thank you so very much, Lord God, for your word. I just pray to God you just open our hearts, may our hearts uh, be good ground for the seed to be sown tonight, dear God, and the results are in your hands. God, help me to, uh, just help me to sow it, and I'll praise you for the harvest now, Father God. Lord, we just love you and bless you. In Jesus' name I pray, believing. And if you can agree with that prayer, help me say amen. 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 You may be seated. Towards the end of the first century, we're talking about around um, 80, to, um, 80 to 90 A.D., and towards the end of that first century, all of the apostles were dead, okay? So track with me here for just a moment. All the apostles, with the exception of one, were dead. You know, Peter was dead. James was dead. Uh, the apostle Paul was dead. Philip, Nathaniel, you know, all of them were dead, with the exception of one, and he outlived them all, and it was John the apostle. He was one of the first apostles, and he lived to be the last apostle. So I'm just going to give you a breakdown of who wrote this book, John, and his age. He lived to be what we believe well into his 90s and pastored the church at Ephesus. You know, so he was, the, he was the author of this gospel that bears his name, but not just this book. He wrote four other books. He wrote the epistles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And, of course, the, the book that we absolutely love now as mature Christians, but as, as young Christians, we, we kind of stayed away from the book of the Revelation, right? It, it just scared us, right? But now we just can't wait. We, can't, we, we, just, we are ready and can't wait for those truths, those end times truths, to unfold. So John, he wrote the book of the Revelation as well. So we, uh, as perhaps into his 80s when he took the time to write these five books. So at the time of his writing, all the other New Testament manuscripts were already in circulation. There were three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, already in circulation. All of the Pauline epistles, already in circulation. The Hebrew epistles, you know, the general Hebrew epistles, already in circulation. So at the time of his writing, all of the New Testament was complete, with the exception of another Gospel, the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and the book of the Revelation. So I want you to see that Matthew, he wrote, his, his Gospel was a Christian masterpiece, Mark, his gospel, was a precise account of Peter's preaching, and Luke was another Christian classic. So the question that we might ask today in the 21st century is, well, if most of the New Testament was in circulation, and there's already three you know, strong you know, uh, um, uh, masterpieces of gospels out there in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, why did the Holy Spirit of God inspire the Apostle John to write another gospel, three more epistles, and of course, the book of the Revelation. And the answer is simple. It's because there was still something, there was still a message that God had that was unsaid that God wanted to be said. And so that is why God inspired the Apostle John. Can you imagine, was there anybody else in his era? Was there anybody else that, that was qualified at his time uh, near the end of that first century to write another gospel or to write three more epistles and to write the book of Revelation? The answer is no, because the, all the other apostles were already in heaven. You get me? So nobody else had as much ex experience as, as John did. Think about it. 
Now, he was there the whole three and a half years of Jesus' public ministry. He's seen, all the, he's seen all the miracles. He's seen Jesus take five fish and two loaves of bread and stretch them out so much that they would feed almost 15,000 people. John saw Jesus touch blinded eyes, restore sight, and touch deaf ears, and restore hearing, raise up dead people. He was, there at the, um, he was there at the trial of Jesus. He was there at the crucifixion. He witnessed the resurrection. He saw the ascension. And bless God, he was the charter member of the first church. David Peoples, charter member here. We love David, but I tell you what, David is a charter member of Blackrock, but John, he was a charter member of the first church. That'll bless you right there, right? So nobody else had near as much experience and wisdom and knowledge as John had. So it, it, there is no question why God the Holy Spirit rose him up to write the book that's seated in your lap right now, the one we're reading, the Gospel of John. That's why God rose him up to write this, um, to uh, write and record this gospel. Now let me give you this real quick. The focal passage of the entire book, there's 21 chapters, and it's going to be a long time before we get there. The rapture might even take place before we get to chapter 20. Y'all okay with that? Hey, it may. It may take place before we get to preaching tonight. And I believe we are just that, that, we are that close. So but anyways, the focal passage is John chapter 20, verse 31, and it says this, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life through His name. Whose name? Jesus' name. So John states the reason. He states the, uh, the, his, his whole premise for writing his gospel. When he said that these things are written, he's referring to all 21 chapters. He says they are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through His name. Okay, so Matthew... His gospel, he wrote primarily to the Jews. Mark wrote primarily to the Romans, while Luke, who was a Greek, he wrote primarily to the Greeks, but John wrote primarily to the church. And if the church then, listen to me now, if the church then, you know, towards the end of the first century, if they needed the message that would encourage them, if they needed this gospel to encourage them and to, and to galvanize their faith, so that, he, as, as he said there in verse 31 of chapter 20, but these things are written that you, speaking to the church, might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that, be, and that believing you might have life, through his name. I love what the Apostle Paul, when his second epistle to Timothy, he said, but, uh, he said I am persuaded. He said, um, uh, 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 he said there, um, nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he, God, is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Is there anybody else tonight that's persuaded that God is able to keep your commitment that you've made to him? God is the one that got you saved. God is the one that can keep you saved. I just spoke to a woman just yesterday, you know, uh, and, and I'm not trying to berate this point. You know, it, was, it, was, it was boldly and emphatically preached the Wednesday night of our revival. But just uh, yesterday, her and her husband arrived with me to go make another visitation. And she told me that I'll share with her our revival. And she said that, you know, she's had uh, through her, her lifetime where she's doubted her salvation experience. And I just said, hey, listen to this. We, we Christians, we kind of get the idea that uh, we see ourselves just reaching up and just, we got a grip on God's hand, and we're just holding on tight to God, and I'm not, I don't, I don't want to let go, I don't want to slip off of God's hand before He takes me home and lose my salvation. And so we kind of get the idea that every time we do something wrong, and we do something, we, and we do, okay? Am I right, Christians? When none of us is, is, is living a life of sinless perfection, we will mess up and do things wrong. But we kind of got the idea that when we do mess up, that, that our, our grip seems to get loose. And if we really mess up, we're going to just slip off his hand. There's a problem with that. You know what the problem is? The problem with that is, is that we, uh, according to the biblical perspective, it's not about me holding on to Jesus' hand. Are you listening tonight? It is the fact that Jesus is holding on to my hand. And regardless, and listen, I don't want to sin. You know, I don't want to sin. I find myself repenting more after I got saved than before I got saved. And before I got saved, I was running to sin. Now I'm trying to run away from sin. But the simple fact is that even when we do sin, Jesus is not gonna just it's not gonna weaken his grip where he can't hold on to us anymore. It's listen, I am persuaded that God is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. You okay? So, as soon as we begin reading the Gospel of John, we immediately know that his gospel is different than the other gospels. And let me give you some reasons why. 
You will not find a genealogy in the book of John. You will not find no manger scene, no boyhood of Jesus, no baptism of Jesus, no temptation in the wilderness. There will be no Mount of Transfiguration. There is no Gethsemane that is explained in detail. What you will find is a few chosen miracles that John chose to insert. We will, we will read and uh, dissect the famous I am sayings that John recorded Jesus saying and a few other discourses found that are found nowhere else in the Bible. Somebody says it was almost as if John, when he wrote his gospel, he sat down in one hand with a pen and paper and he had the gospel of Luke in his other hand and the things that Luke put in his gospel, John didn't put in his gospel and the things that Luke left out of his gospel, John made sure he put in his gospel. So it's definitely different than all the other three. Luke wrote to show that Jesus was the Son of Man, but John wrote to show us that Jesus is the Son of God. Well, the first five verses, John showed us the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm not going to go there. We've already preached those uh, first five verses. But in those first five verses, the Apostle John showed us that uh, the deity of Jesus Christ. And he shows us there that Jesus is eternally God. He is equally God. And He will forever be essentially God. Jesus is equally God, eternally God, and essentially God. So uh, uh, as, as, the tra- as John transitions into verse number 6, notice with me our text there tonight. The Bible says there was a man sent from God whose name was John. So as the elderly apostle John, late in his life, as he transitioned to verse 6, he's reminded of a central character early in his life, at the, right just prior to the beginning of Jesus' ministry, whose name was John the Baptist. And so that's who John the Apostle now tells about in verse 6. It's almost as if John is saying, hey, to his audience, I'm, I'm, John, I'm John the Apostle. I want you to meet John the Baptist. And so he introduces us to John the Baptist in verse number 6. So a few, just three points I want to make to you tonight about, uh, about uh, verse 6, 7, and 8. Not necessarily about John, but I want, you, I want to show you tonight the messenger, the motive, and the method. Look at, first of all, the messenger. Who the messenger was. It's clearly identified. It is John the Baptist. Verse 6, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. So just, just so you know, with clarity going forward, it's not John the Apostle. He, this is John the Baptist that John the Apostle is referencing here. So it says there that, that, that there was a man sent from God. Or we can say it this way, God sent a man. God sent a man. Who else would God send? Who else would God send? Isaiah 40 verse 3 says that, that uh, in, in the prophecy that, uh, that John the Baptist would come, he would, be, he would come pro- proclaiming, the king is coming, the king is coming. So I want you to see that God, he did not send Gabriel, he did not send Michael or any of the angelic hosts, but he sent a man. And here's why. The Bible says in the book of Revelation that when we, uh, when there's time no more and we're in heaven, that we will sing a brand new song, we will sing a song of the redeemed. Y'all, do y'all know about that? Oh, if you don't sing here, you're going to sing there, okay? I promise you. So you might as well just go ahead and participate here, get your vocalizer ready and warmed up. You're going to sing that chorus. If, if you are redeemed, if you get there, you're going to sing that song, I promise you. And mom and dad ain't going to force you to do it. The preacher ain't going to force you. The choir director in heaven ain't going to do it. You are going to just praise God for all of eternity. Somebody said, wouldn't that get boring? No, absolutely it would not get boring. Praising God for all of eternity. So anyways... Y'all made me lose track. I forgot where I was going with that point, but maybe you got something anyways. But anyways, so God sent a man. It was a man sent of God. God sent a man. That's what it was because the, when we sing that song of the redeemed, all of the angels who sing holy, holy, holy right now, they're praising God right now. They're going to have to be quiet for just a moment because they have never been redeemed. They have never experienced what it's like to be transformed from darkness to light. They are a created being. God created them the way they are today. They were thousands of years ago. They have never experienced the grace of God to touch and change our lives. So when God sends somebody uh, to reach somebody else with the gospel, that's why He sent a man. He sent a, he sent a God-man, the John the Baptist, who was just full of the Spirit of God. And if you wonder what kind of, what kind of man was he exactly, somebody asked this one old boy one time, well, who do, you think the best, who do you think the best human being has ever been, all of mankind, who ever walked the face of the earth? And the old boy said, well, according to my wife, it's her first husband. But anyways, well, if you was to ask Jesus that, if you was to ask Jesus that question, who was the best human being who ever walked the face of the earth? You know what Jesus said? 
And I don't have the address for this, but I'm kind of paraphrasing what Jesus said. He says, there had never, there's not been one born of woman that is greater than John the Baptist. So God sent him, inspired him to come preaching and proclaiming this message. So, matter of fact, y'all know where John came from, right? The city he came from? John was from Japan. Y'all know that, right? It's in the Bible. The Bible says he was, a, he was the forerunner of Jesus. And they make Toyota foreigners in Japan. But anyways, just make sure y'all listening out there. But he, he, really, he really was a prophet. And he was a, he was a prophet. And he was a, he was a Nazarite. He was a Nazarite. There's three lifelong Nazarites in the Bible. Samuel, the first we know about or read about. Sa- excuse me, Samson would be, then Samuel. And then we read about John the Baptist. Now these Nazarites... You're talking about a commitment. They were a committed man of God. And let me share with you why. And I'm not going to go in great depth and detail on the Nazarite vow, but just the three uh, elements that we know uh, uh, most commonly about a Nazarite who took the Nazarite vow is that they could not come in contact with death. So if uh, if they had a a, a death in their family, they could not get associated, they they could not get near that person. So listen, when they take a Nazarite vow, they're putting all of their affections on the altar and they're literally saying this, there is nobody, no person in my life that I love more than the Lord Jesus Christ. That is what the Nazarite vow says. All of their affections were on the altar. Not only that, they, had, uh, they could have no contact with, with, uh, with, uh, with cutting shears or clippers. They couldn't get a haircut or shave, bless God. So they, all, of their, uh, um, all of their appearance was on the altar. But not only that, they could not come in contact or drink any wine or strong drink. So all of their appetite was on the altar. Do you see how committed these Nazarites would have been? I wouldn't have made it because I like getting a haircut. Y'all with me? Amen? I like getting a haircut every now and then. So, yes, these Nazarites had high standards of consecration. And they needed to be. John the Baptist needed to be. And here's why. Because before John stepped onto the scene to prepare the way as the forerunner, the one who would come before and precede the Lord Jesus Christ and prepare the way and to get ready to, uh, to, to parade Jesus in with the gospel of preaching of repentance. Prior to that, there was 400 years of darkness. There was 400 years of silence when, when all of heaven was silent. You know, to the end of the Old Testament writing book of Malachi, to the New Testament book, 400 years of silence, 400 years of darkness, and all of a sudden, John the Baptist steps on the scene, preaching, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. So all of a sudden, John shows up preaching the truth of the gospel. He is bearing light. He is sharing light. He is shining light. And so his message of the Lord Jesus Christ dispels and breaks up the 400 years of darkness. So he needed to be a man sent of God. He needed to be a man of high consecration and high standards. And so he definitely needed to be a Nazarite. So he was a messenger. Look at his motive as we move along in verse 7. We see the messenger in verse 6. That we see the motive in verse 7. Here's his motive. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might, what does that word say? Might believe. He had one singular purpose. One singular purpose. And that was to share His light and to shine His light. Do you know how many purposes you have? Don't say any either. Don't tell me zero. I don't have any purposes. I'm still convinced. I'm still in the deep convictions that God still calls people. He still calls particular people to particular places for particular purposes. God has a reason for all of our lives, but we all have one singular purpose. There was not one, there was not many motives why John did what he did, and we shouldn't have many motives why we do what we do. We, have, we should have one singular purpose, and that is to shine our light and to share His light. Is that right, church? You know, we, there's many different, many different tools and instruments that shine light. There's a flashlight, there's headlights on a car, there's house lights, you know, there's lights on your cell phone. Many, many different variations of lights, but they all have one purpose, and that's to dispel darkness and to give us guidance through dark times. And that is our purpose as a child of God. We may have different callings. God may never call you to pastor a church. He may never call you to be a deacon or sing in a choir or praise team. But listen, uh, we all have at least one purpose, and that should be the motive that drives us, and that is to share and to shine Jesus' light. Y'all okay with that? Amen, amen. Uh, So we see the motive. 
the motive of Jesus. Um, so he says that the word witness there is used a couple times. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. So what is a witness? Go with me to the courtroom and we, we immediately know there's a, differ, uh, there's, a, there's a difference between a witness and a lawyer. Is that right? See, a, a lawyer is there, and they're there to argue their case and try to prove a point and try to influence people to make their, their desired decision. But a witness is, he's there for a different reason. A witness is there to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help them God. Now, we all know lawyers, they, they do the same thing, right? They tell the truth, the whole truth, and making sure y'all still listening. So witness is called solely to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So John the Baptist, did he know the truth? Yes, he did. He knew the truth of Jesus, that he was the Messiah, that he come to fulfill Old Testament prophecy, that he was the Son of God. And since he knew the truth, and since he was familiar with the truth, guess what truth he shared? He shared the truth of Jesus Christ. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. So listen, let me, let me simplify, because a lot of times we make things complex, and we give ourselves excuses. And we, give ourselves, we talk ourselves out of sharing our faith. And we talk ourselves out of being a witness. And, uh, but let me just make it very simplistic. Just tell people what you know. Is that, is, really, is that too much to ask? Well, preacher, I, I don't know that much. Uh, I, maybe I'm a brand new Christian. Maybe you're not a brand new Christian, but you don't know that much. Listen, just share with people what you know. Just share, just share with what you know. But, but I'm so afraid. I'm so afraid they're going to ask you something I don't know. Okay? And that's going to happen, but here's what you do. When they ask you something you don't know, if y'all taking notes, write this down. Here's what you do. You look in their eyes and tell them, I don't know. Listen, because when you tell them you don't know, when you don't know, and when, they'll be more apt to believe you when you tell them what you do know. So just be honest and tell you, you know, that's a great question. I'm going to do some research and study, and I'll get back with you. But listen, just tell them what you know. I remember, I remember hearing Johnny Hunt one time share when he, it, when he first became a Christian, and he didn't, uh, he didn't really know this, so he immediately went to the book of Revelation and started reading the book of Revelation. And he, he said he started reading about scorpions stinging people in the, in, in the tribulation. And he went, to, uh, he went to witness one of his friends. He said, he said so-and-so, he said, you got to get saved. you got to give your life to Jesus. And his friend was like, why? He said, because if you don't, the scorpions, they're going to sting you. And his buddy came out to him a few days and said, hey, you, you need to stop praying for me because uh, I'm an electrician by trade and I was putting wires to get together today and I was afraid, fear struck me that if I put the wrong ones together that scorpions might come and get me and start stinging me. I want you to get the gist of that cute story. You do your part, share what you know, take the knowledge that you have of the Word of God and share it. Yeah, that's doing our part. And when we share it and we do our part, God, well, see, our part is so natural. It's just like sowing seed. Anybody can sow seed. Anybody can just go out there and just throw some seed out in the yard. And that's all sharing God's Word and the knowledge you have of it is, is sowing the seed of the Word of God. It's a natural process, but when we do our part, which is a natural process, how many of you know that God does His part, which is a supernatural process? And a few years ago, you know, at, uh, on, uh, on my secular job at Southeast Toyota, you know, many of y'all met the guy. He came to one of our services last year. And uh, J Jason Hicks was his name, and he was a borderline atheist, and, and, he, and he talked with me about things, uh, how he struggled with believing in God that can create it all. And I don't know all the answers about creation. I, I wish I was smarter than I am sometimes to really go in depth and to really share, you know, but I just, I just I, I shared what I knew. And guess what God did? God just used that to bring conviction to him. And months, it was months later, but uh, uh, on an afternoon, I believe it's September the 17th, the date, that, the date that it was, that he prayed and invited Jesus Christ to come at his heart right there at Southeast Toyota. But listen, just share what you know. Do the natural. Let God do the supernatural. So we talked about the motive. Look at the method in verse 8. Here's the method. He, 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 he is John the Baptist. He was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. So John the Baptist was not the light. Jesus is the light. Now, so look at the relationship between the sun and the moon, okay? The sun, it's an orb of blazing fire. It is a nuclear bomb that shines light continuous. Is that right? Continuous it shines. Now, look at the moon over there. The moon sitting over there. It's a dead world in space, and it's a massive chunk of lifeless rock, but when we see somebody, they'll say, man, did you see the, the moon last night? It, it was shining so bright. No, it wasn't. You might have seen a reflection. You might have saw some light, 
But that was not the light of the moon. That was the light being reflected from the sun. Can I tell you that the first 16 years of my life, all I was was a lifeless chunk of rock. And I was pretty chunky too. I was fat back in the day, I promise you that. I got pictures that will support that and prove that. But before Christ, before Christ, you, sir, you, ma'am, this may take offense, you may take offense to this, but before Jesus Christ, you was a lifeless chunk of rock. You had no light of yourself, and even today, you still don't have any light of yourself. But if there's any good in you, it's because God is in you, and Jesus is radiating, and you are reflecting His light. So our, our method of how we shine His light, when the Bible says we're the light of the world, and we, when we have a story, and, a, a, and when we have a testimony to share, it's not us, it's, it's not us bragging on what we have done, because stay with me now, when we, when we come across people who say, you know what, I, I never share my faith, I never witness people, I just hope they see me. I hope they see my life. I hope, they see that, I hope they see that I don't drink anymore, and that I don't smoke anymore, and that I'm not committing sexual immorality anymore, and, and just uh, I'm not doing things that you... I hope they see my life, and, and I hope that just reaches them. I got a word for that, actually a statement for that. And what, what I call that, that is claiming righteousness on false pretenses. Wow. Think about that. If you do have God in you, you are saved... And you're just hoping people see the good things in your life, but you never tell them why you changed. You never tell them, it's hey, it's not me, it's Jesus. When we just live and hope people that see the things we have done, it's claiming righteousness on false pretenses because we know the truth, right? Did I, did I do this to myself? Did I, did I change my language? Did I change my desire? No, God did all of that. So if I know that is truth and I hang on to it, what am I? A false witness. Is that right? If a witness comes walking up to the witness stand and he tells half the truth, but yet he holds half of it in, he is not a faithful witness. He's a false witness. And listen, when we stand before God, I don't want to be a false witness who withheld truth. Listen, when that witness takes the witness stand, he has truth that can liberate somebody out there seated beside that lawyer. Listen, as a child of God, it's not our life that saves anybody. It's the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And when we, and we, and when we withhold that truth, we are not giving the person out there who can be liberated for all of eternity, the chance to meet the Jesus that we have met. We see the messenger, the method, and his motive. And you know what? We may not be a Nazarite. I get that. But every single one of us, we're a messenger. Every single one of us is a messenger. You know what? I might not be a blues brother, but I am a brother. And I am on mission from God. You, are, you ain't a blues brother either. I don't think you are. But you are on mission from God. God has a mission for every single one of us. And it is to share His light and to shine His light. We are not to conceal His light. We are to reveal His light. We are not to shove His light, but we are to share His light. We are not to veil His light, but we are to visualize His light. You know what happens when we share His light and shine His light? People are forced to make a choice. Is that right? Look at verse 9. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Uh, he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Look, look at verse 9. I want you to wrap your minds around this now. That was the true light. Jesus is the true light which lighteth, what does that next word say? Every man that cometh into the world. Do you know what every man means in the Greek? Every man. <laughs> Without distinction, it means everybody Every single person has a certain measure of light. Let me break it down a little further. Even people who are in the most remotest parts of the world, who don't have the written revelation like you have, you can, they, they can't look up a screen like we have, and see that's the written revelation. Even people in the remotest parts of the world who don't have the written revelation, you know what they have? They have creation and they have conscience. Creation bears witness, read Romans chapter 1, that nobody, absolutely nobody, will be without excuse. Because creation speaks, it speaks to our conscience that there is a God. And according to verse 9, the inspired author of John says that every man that comes in the world is lighted by Jesus. There's a certain light 
God gave the Jews the light of covenant, and they are going to be held responsible. Uh, God has given us the light of Jesus Christ, and we will be responsible. Listen, nobody, I don't, nobody will be without excuse, but especially America. Is that right? Good night. We've got a church on every corner. We've got the Bible everywhere. People are Facebooking and tweeting it and Instagramming. It. it is out there. People know, but watch what happens. Verse 10, the Bible says, He was in the world, and the world was made by Him, and the world knew Him not. Picture it. Jesus is in the world, and he, He's in the world that He made. Can you imagine that? He did, hey, when he's walking around Galilee and Judea and the hills, he, he knew the topography. He didn't need a map. You know why? He made the roads. And not only that, he made the dirt that made the dirt roads. And he walked by the Sea of Galilee. He knew where the shallow parts were. He knew where certain fish and species were swimming because he made it all. Watch this. The Bible says this in verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Okay? Whenever light is revealed, it makes us make a choice. Remember, those are the day you made a choice. And that's why you're here today as a child of God, because light was revealed to you, a light switch was turned on in your soul, and you was forced to make a choice, and I'm glad I made the right choice. I'm glad I'm on God's team. Can I get a witness? The Bible says in verse 10, they were in the, and the world knew Him not. Let me say it this way. They knew of Him but they didn't want nothing to do with him. Oh yeah, they knew of Jesus. They wanted to kill him. They wanted to stone him. They led him up to one of the cliffs. They were ready to throw him off the mountain I read the other day. Yeah, but he just, he miraculously walked through the crowd and escaped them. They knew of him, but they did not want nothing to do with him. Has anything changed in 2,000 years? No. The world knows him, is that right? Oh, they know of him. They read about the, uh, well, not, they don't read, but they hear about, you know, they hear the Christmas songs. And maybe they're at the mall. And they hear the songs uh, about the baby Jesus. They know of Jesus, but they don't want nothing to do with Jesus. You ever turn the light on uh, in, some, in a room where somebody's sleeping? And it's a rude awakening. And they say this, turn the light off. My goodness, I don't want that light shining in my eyes. They're forced to make a choice when light comes on and they choose darkness. They're in a the comfortable bed, and it's in the cold of winter, and they tell you, turn the light off before I get up and slap in the name of Jesus, right? And so, listen, they make a choice. They choose darkness rather than light. You know what happens in a lot of church services? People hear the truth. People hear the truth, and the light is shined in their heart. But they make a choice and say, it's too bright. I like, I like living in darkness. I like my life. I like continuing to do the things I do. They know of Jesus but they don't want nothing to do with Jesus. When the light is shined, and when we shine God's light, people are forced to make a choice. Verse 11. He came in His own, and His own received Him not. The Jewish nation turned their back on Him, and they rejected Jesus Christ. So um, His own received Him not. Now, so when light was revealed, it puts, us into, it puts people into two categories. We see in verse 10 and 11, the people who resisted the light. Now we're going to see in verse 12 and 13, people who have... Excuse me, people who receive the light. Verse 12, But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. The but there in verse 12. You've got to love the but. The word but there, I want you to see it's a small hinge which swings great truths and destinies. And that's not the only place. In many places where that word but, it really changes the significance of things. One of the more popular ones is Romans 6, 23, which says the wages of sin are death, but... The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But as many received Him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. Notice the three verbs here. Believe, receive, become. Say with me. Believe, receive, become. It's in that order. Receive is put first because the importance needs to be seen there. But it is believe, receive, and become. Now, these are the three words. Now, we are to believe on what? What are we to believe on? Well, the Bible says that at the end of verse 12, even to them that believe on His name. We're to believe on the name 
of Jesus Christ, a name that is above every single name. Matthew mentions Jesus' name 151 times. Mark mentions the name of Jesus 13 times. Luke mentions the name of Jesus 88 times. And John, the Apostle John, who leaned his head on the breast of Jesus at the, at the, uh, uh, at the um, upper room's uh, last supper, he really loved Jesus. He mentioned his name 247 times. We are saved when we believe on the name of of Jesus Christ, the name, the only name that, uh, that, that salvation is made. There's a story told of a, a kindergarten Sunday school teacher teaching her class, and she told them, listen, said, the only way to go to heaven, you must be saved. You must believe in the name of Jesus. And she repeated herself throughout the whole, her whole class. She said, you, in order to go to heaven, you must be saved. You must believe on the name of Jesus. And toward the end of her class, she asked her class, she said, students, she said, what do you have to do in order to go to heaven? And she thought, man, she'd driven the point home, and they're all going to walk out and be responsive. One little boy raised his hand and said, you must be dead to go to heaven. And that's, that's, that's right. He was accurate. But listen, you must believe on the name of Jesus. But you know what belief does? Belief, believing in Jesus, believing in the name of Jesus, it'll get you on the steps. And that's, that's important, okay? Because many people are still in the denial stage. They're, they're still in the doubting stage. They don't believe that Jesus is who He says He is. They don't believe that He's the Messiah. They don't believe He's the Son of God. They, they just, they're doubting. But belief is step number one. It'll get you on the steps. But I want you to hear this tonight. Hear my heart. Being on the steps is not the same thing as being in the house. Is that right? Hey, it's not until you get in the house you get to sit down at the table and have fellowship with the guests. Listen, we, it is not until we get in the house with Jesus that we get to sit down with him on a personal basis and have fellowship with him. What did Jesus say in John, in, in, excuse me, in Revelation 3, 20? He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man, what he say, if any man opens, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. You know what word sup means? Supper. Supper. You know, uh, uh, there's a difference, uh, there's a, the difference between supper, lunch, and breakfast. Breakfast is quick. Lunch is grab it and, and, and grab it and slam it down. But supper is meant to be kind of sit down and enjoy, and it takes more time. Jesus didn't say, hey, I want to have breakfast with you. Hey, if you, got, you can fit me in the lunch schedule and have lunch. He said, no, I want to have supper with you. I want to have an intimate moment with you where you're not rushed so we can sit down and have some fellowship. Listen, I want you to see the progression of salvation. You believe in Jesus. You believe in the name of Jesus. That gets you on the step, but it is when you receive Jesus Christ. That gets you into the house. That gets you into the household of faith. And the third step. See, the first step, the first two steps, that's our part. I chose to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And I, it, when God showed me that light that, that I need, needed to see that I was a sinner in need of a Savior, I believed in Jesus. I stepped up on the steps. Then I prayed and invited Christ in my heart. Step two, I received Jesus. And you know why I'm standing here as a Christian today? All because of step number three. Step number two, the first two steps I did, step number three is what God did. See, I believed and received. Then when, when I received Jesus, God said, become. God said, become. Verse 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he, God, power to become the sons of God. Of God. So just being on the steps is not the same thing as being in the house. It's when we believe, receive Jesus Christ, and then God Almighty, the word power there, in the Greek it means dunamis. It's where we get our word dynamite from. It's explosive power. Nothing parallels on earth to the power of God. It's when we receive Jesus Christ. That is when God gives us the power, or we can say the ability, to become the Son of God. And it is at that moment we are birthed and born into the household of faith and into the family of God, it is then and only then that God imparts life. Not just life. We already have life as in existing, but when we receive Jesus Christ, God gives us the Zoe life, which means the God life, which is eternal life. I'm almost done. I know I've, I kind of preached long tonight, but there's just a lot to say, a lot on my heart tonight. So um, we do our part as a sinner believe and receive, God gives the power and the ability to become the child of God. And can I, can I explain it further? Probably not. <laughs> you know, because it, it, really, it really blows my mind that when I, as a sinner, come before the King of Kings and just admit how, how much I need Him, He, God, gives me, He gave me the power and the ability to be birthed into the family 
of God. It's not a natural birth. You know that. It's a supernatural birth. Look at, first, look at verse 13. Will I close? Uh, John goes on to say there, which were born, not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So we're, we are, this birth, this spiritual birthday, is, has nothing to do with human descent. Look at verse 13, which were born not of blood. It has nothing to do with genetics. My kids will not go to heaven because their daddy's a pastor. My kids will not go to heaven because their daddy's a Christian. It has nothing to do with genetics. We, you know, we don't just pass on uh, d- the DNA of our Christianity onto our kids. It has nothing to do with that. It's not about our genes. It's all about Jesus, about them coming to a personal knowledge of Jesus Christ himself. So if you still have lost family members, continue to pray and point them to Jesus. So it has nothing to do with human descent. It has nothing to do with human desire. Verse 13 goes on to say there, nor of the will of the flesh. You know, as much as I want to, I could say, man, I really wish that I was a millionaire. I would never, ever wish myself by wishful thinking a millionaire. Somebody says, man, I, 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 I hope I go to heaven. I'm really, man, I wish I could go to heaven when I die one day. Wishing won't get you there. It has nothing to do with human hands and human desire, but it all has to do with being saved and receiving Jesus Christ. And finally, it has nothing to do with human design. 13, the last part, nor the will of man. I'll ask people, have you, have you been baptized? Oh yeah, I got baptized when I was a baby. Well, that's the will of man trying to put water on you. You didn't, you didn't know what you were doing when you was a baby. That's why we teach believers baptism here, where your baptism is on the right side of your salvation, where you don't get baptized, then get saved. You get baptized because you got saved. Right. So you see, salvation is not of any of the schemes and the religious uh, uh, the rituals that are out there. It has nothing to do with that, but it is all the sovereign design of God. But verse 13 finishes and says this, but of God. God wills to save you. God desires to save you. You know, you know I, I just want to leave you with this note here. That Listen, God is absolutely crazy about you. God is crazy about you. And the, we see the whole plan unfold here. And I know this is, this is, I could, this is some really some deep, deep stuff here. But bottom line, Jesus is the light. And He, give up, he give, has given us enough light, even, a, even without the written revelation of God, to show us that we need to be saved. past 40 minutes, you have heard the Gospel of John preached to you. This is what was inspired in the heart of the Apostle John. Sir, ma'am, if you're here tonight and you never have received this light, oh yeah, you never never rejected the existence of God. You've always given God the credit for creating us, but you have not taken that next step in, in receiving Jesus Christ. And therefore, consequently, you have not become a child of God. That can change tonight. That can change tonight. But listen, you must willingly choose. I can't go out there and just force Jesus in your heart. He's not just going to come in here and just build tonight and just, uh, just supernaturally just jump inside your soul. You must willingly say yes to Jesus. It's not about forced love. It's about, cho- about chosen love. And He wants you to choose Him. Many of you have. Many of you have chosen Jesus. Best decision you've ever made. Hands down, am I right? You know, our spouse, huge choice. Where are we going to live? Where are we going to go to church at? Huge choices. But the best, the most single, uh, most important decision you will ever make is what you do tonight. Sir, man, you never have been saved. The light has been shown to you. Light has been turned on. You're forced to make a choice. Am I going to resist that light or am I going to receive that light? I pray you do the right thing. And the, the, and, and the right thing is, is to choose Jesus. Well, I don't understand it all. Hey, just trust. You know, faith, listen, if you knew it all, you wouldn't need faith. You know why I still need faith? I don't know it all. Would you stand with me tonight? If I can get our musicians to please come to the platform tonight. We're going to prepare to give you an opportunity. Not, not we. I, 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 rather, I, I really said that arrogantly. Like, I'm going to give you an opportunity. I can't do that. That is beyond my pay grade. God, I believe God, if God is giving the opportunity to trust Jesus tonight, sir, ma'am, would you do it tonight? Say, don't wait till next Sunday. It would be great. It would be great if I could promise you, hey, uh, brother or sister, uh, I know you need to be saved, but, uh, you know, we really went late tonight. How about you come back next Sunday and we'll take care of that? One thing wrong with that, we're not guaranteed to make it to Thursday. So, friend, I encourage you, if you're here apart uh, apart from Christ, 
Would you trust Jesus to save you tonight? Hey, stop resisting, and would you receive him tonight? With every head bowed, every eye closed, raise your hearts to Jesus. You know who you are. You have the information, you have the knowledge, you have the light you need to be saved tonight. You will not leave. Hey, you will never stand before God and say, I never knew about you, Lord. I never heard what I needed to do. Man, I sure would love to go to heaven and live with you for all of eternity, but uh, bottom line, God, I just didn't know. Now I can see God pulling up the, the, the projection screen in heaven and showing you standing and sitting at Black Rabbit Church on January 21st, 2015, and you hang your head in shame. Hey, don't be that person. Don't be that person. I'm going to lead you in a prayer of repentance. But don't pray to me. I can't save you. Pray to the Father. He can. You ready? Pray this in the meaning of your heart. Dear Lord Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner. I need to be saved. I want to be saved. Only you, Jesus, can save me. Tonight, I believe and I receive you as my Savior. Thank you for allowing me to become a child of God. From this day forward, I'll live for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. With every head bowed, every eye still closed. Nobody looking around. Please, nobody moving. Sir, ma'am, let me ask this question. Tonight, nobody's looking around, just me, me and God. Tonight, was tonight the first time you prayed to receive Christ as your Savior? And if you did, would you just raise your hand? Slip it up real high so I can see it. And this is not, just don't seal the deal, okay? And this don't guarantee you can go to heaven, but I just want to know, you know, I can pray for you. And I want to uh, uh, just give you some uh, counsel, some godly counsel about following through with your commitment to live for Christ from this day forward, anybody at all? Okay, here's what we're going to do. I see nobody raising their hand, but maybe you're hesitant. Maybe you did pray that prayer tonight. Hey, would you still come forward tonight? Unashamedly, would you come tonight? Step out. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm walking down the step right now. I'm going to meet you down here. Uh, Brother Richie, if you go ahead and sing for us. Orchestra, begin playing. Sir, ma'am, you know who you are. And if there are other decisions, other decisions to be made, other prayers of commitment, would you come and... and, and, and um, I don't leave anything undone with God tonight. As we sing, would you come? The cross upon which Jesus died Is a shelter in which we can hide And His grace so free is sufficient for me and deep is its fountain as wide as a sea there's room at the cross for you there's room at the cross for you the millions have come there's still room for one yes there's room at the cross for you the millions have found him a friend and have turned from the sins they have sinned the same you glad there's still room at the cross, friends? You know, you go into buildings, and they got the, the little plaques on the wall that says maximum occupancy, and it says you when it's maxed out. I, I'm glad to say tonight that I believe that heaven is not maxed out because if it was, Jesus would have already came back, and all of redemption would be done, and we still wouldn't be here, but because we are